Recently, on my weekly international relations show, The Sunday Stream, I have been covering rational choice theory, war, and bargaining models as to show how states engage in war and settlements. During one of these streams, I came across the following comment. Alexander the Great wouldn't have been so busy with all of this bean counting and calculation. And while nations and leaders of the ancient world of course would have considered logistics, warfare, and the act of engaging in war, even in activities to prepare for it, would have held a deep spiritual value. With it being transcendental in nature, it's not readily found within the modern context of warfare in the Western world. Its animating spirituality today lacks transcendentalism or even a call to higher meaning beyond the mortal plane that one might spend a long and hard time looking for when examining the wars of this century. Today we'll be taking a look at Julius Evola and his writings on the spirituality of war and the warrior, and compare them to the numbers-crunching soullessness of modern warfare in the West today. Julius Evola, born in 1898 in the Kingdom of Italy, Evola lived a long life of service, writing hundreds of essays, books, and opinion pieces on esoteric tradition, symbology, and perennialism. Known for his in-depth knowledge of ancient Indo-European traditions and beliefs, criticisms of Christianity, and his association with mid-century Italians. In reference to today's video, I will be referring to Evola's essays in The Metaphysics of War and Sections of Revolt Against the Modern World, with links in the description for your reading pleasure, and with more specific references when necessary. Evola considers war to possess an ancient, transcendental, and spiritual value, as well as something that a warrior had to invest in, to become, rather than something they were naturally by birth or association. It required significant investment to be deemed worthy of such a class, meant to be a leader above all and to lead his men into battle, either to relish in victory or to transcend in death. Avola writes in Revolt Against the Modern World that knighthood was a symbol of investiture and belonging to a warrior caste that shedded its territorial roots. Quote, Knighthood, instead, appeared as a super-territorial and super-national community in which its members, who were consecrated into military priesthood, no longer had a homeland and thus were bound by faithfulness, not to the people, but, on the one hand, but to an ethics that has its fundamental values as honor, truth, courage, and loyalty, and on the other hand, to a spiritual authority, to a universal type which was essentially that of empire." End quote. We'll be taking a closer look at knighthood and war later, but the following passage stands out as he discusses the Holy Roman Empire. Quote, knighthood and the great knightly orders of the Ecumene that were an essential part of the empire, since they represented the political and military counterpart of what the clergy and monastic orders represented to the ecclesiastical order. Knighthood did not necessarily have a hereditary character. It was possible to become a knight, as long as the person wishing to become one performed feats that could demonstrate his heroic contempt for the attachment of life, as well as the above-mentioned faithfulness in both senses of the term." End quote. Seen in European history, there was this great knightly tradition, and even an Anglo-Saxon tradition of knighthood, as Arthurian legend speaks of the great duties and honors, feats of daring that made one possess the qualities to lead men into battle and to be at the knight's round table, and hold reverence, of course, to God on high. Thomas Mallory, or Caxton if you prefer, speak of this tradition that shows of a bygone era of duty, honor, and piety, in one performing and seeking out to perform the deeds to enter this warrior caste. However, in the chapter, The Soul of Chivalry, where these quotes are taken from, Avola does conclude that this tradition soon faded with changes in the church, and with it, the chivalrous warrior caste was soon drawn out in his view, writing, quote, It had to close an eye to the expressions such as that of John of Salisbury's. The military profession, both worthy and necessary, has been instituted by God himself and it even came to see war as an ascetical and immortalizing path. Moreover, thanks to this deviation from the Church of the main themes of primitive Christianity, that during the Middle Ages Europe came to know the last image of a world that in many aspects was of a traditional type. But it wasn't just the older, traditional type of warrior that Evola writes about. 
Of all that was familiar with the ancient and now esoteric traditions, perspectives, and beliefs into not how only the warrior conducted himself, but how war was fought both against the enemy and what it means to win. In the posthumously published book, Metaphysics of War, a collection of articles and essays on the topic, Avola is clear that war was viewed with an intrinsic spiritual meaning along with possessing religious qualities. Writing about the Roman conception of victory, Avola in 1943 wrote the following, quote, Thus, the force of the enterprise of war fell on more than merely human plane, and both the sacrifice and the heroism of the combatant were viewed and considered to be more than merely human. The Roman conception of victory is particularly important. In this conception, every victory had a mystical side in the most objective sense of the term. In the victor, the chief, the imperator, applauded on the battlefield, was sensed the momentary manifestation of a divine force which transfigured and transhumanized him. The military victory ritual itself, in which the imperator, in the original sense, not of emperor, but of a victorious chief, was lifted on a special shield, is not devoid of symbolism, as can be inferred from Aeneas. The shield, previously sanctified in the Capitoline Temple of Jupiter, signifies here the celestial sphere, beyond which victory raises the man who has won." End quote. Later on in The Sacreality of War, published earlier on June 8, 1935, Avola wrote more about Romans and their concept of victory, and what it meant to lead men into the jaws of war and to emerge with victory, often in bloody hand. Quote, We will limit ourselves, however, to mentioning that the ceremony of the triumph in Rome had a character which was far more religious than militaristic in a secular sense, and that many elements seem to show that the Roman attributed victory to his leaders less to their simply human attributes than to a transcendent force manifesting itself in a real and efficient manner through them. Their heroism, and sometimes their sacrifice, as in a rite known as devotio, in which the leaders sacrificed themselves. The victor, in the aforesaid ceremony of triumph, put on the insignia of the supreme god of the capital, as if he was a divine image, and went into the procession to place the triumphal laurels of his victory in the hands of this god, as if to say the latter was the true victor." End quote. This concept of victory is just a glimpse into Avola's view into the ancient traditions of the past, and their evolution, something now long forgotten in today's conceptions of warfare in the West. In reference to the wars of ancient Islam and its predecessor of ancient Persia, Avola acknowledges the traditions of fighting two wars, one of which is civilizational and material, the other being the war fought in oneself when trying to adhere to his faith and spiritual law, a tradition that still bears some resemblance to that part of the world today. In his 1935 essay, The Greater War and Lesser War, Avola writes the following, quote, the lesser war here corresponds to the exoteric war, the bloody battle which is fought with material arms against the enemy, against the barbarian, against an inferior race over whom the superior right is claimed, or, finally, when the event is motivated by a religious justification against the infidel. No matter how terrible and tragic the events, no matter how huge the destruction, this war, metaphysically, still remains a lesser war. The greater, or holy war, is contrarily of the interior and intangible order. It is the war which is fought against the enemy, the barbarian, the infidel, whom everyone bears in himself, or whom everyone can see arising in himself on every occasion that he tries to subject his whole being to a spiritual law, appearing in the forms of craving, partiality, passion, instinctuality, weakness, and inward cowardice. The enemy within the natural man must be vanquished, its resistance broken, chained and subjected to the spiritual man, this being the condition of reaching inner liberation, the triumphant peace which allows one to participate in what is beyond both life and death. With these insights based on Evola's readings, writings, and research, one's attention should be brought towards the present. In our secular world, in our modern world, in our liberal world, where are our knights? 
Where is the animating spirit that brings one to rise to the occasion and lead able men to victory? As one looks towards the last 20 years of war the United States and its coalition partners have recently left, one can see the spiritual and material emptiness of its leadership, the lack of spirit and desire towards a real victory against an enemy who knew the meaning of greater war. Even the idea of a greater, transcendental, or spiritual meaning is lost to us, and the slightest reference to it is deemed politically incorrect or gauche. Just as George W. Bush invoked the word crusade 20 years ago, it was met with criticism and called an indelicate gaffe. Even the briefest mention of the Christian traditions of the West is called out of touch by its media heads and politicians. Wherein the U.S. and other nations go to war to rid the world of fundamentalist terrorism, who view them as nothing more than the great Satan, we can see how Evola's commentaries on the lesser and greater war still ring true to this day. Even the more contemporary political scholars and writers, such as Samuel P. Huntington, known for his book The Clash of Civilizations in 1996, warned about the ongoing clash between secular liberalism and the world of Islam, writing that while the West wishes to modernize Islam, the Islamic world wishes to Islamize modernity. The U.S.-led coalition fought the lesser war, but could not find itself to battle an enemy, hardened by the greater war within themselves and their own religious convictions to drive a foreign invader from their homeland. What transcendental value, what animating spirit can motivate the West to fight such an enemy? Fighting a secular, logistical war, whose attempts to win the hearts and minds could never work on the citizens they tried it on, because they saw them as nothing more than temporary invaders, fighting merely a material conflict. Can a secular ideology, meant only for the ways that man can govern himself on this mortal coil, that of liberalism, lead men to be hardened and acknowledge the greater war in some way that gives them the will to fight and carry on? Even while this progressive dogma, a heretical offshoot, a fan-fiction-esque version of Christianity, infects the American institutions and attempts to infect European ones, does not have the ability to bring people to fight for a victory that shows the superiority of their faith. Fighting for human rights? Democracy? Girls' schools halfway around the world? With no hardened sense of faith to go on, no knightly caste to lead them to victory, only with its scribes, priests, and bean counters pulling them in every direction, thrashing into the void with no end in sight. Jacob Siegel in the American Affairs Journal wrote about it perfectly in the summer issue of 2020, titled Data-Driven Defeat, Information versus Interests in Afghanistan, where he writes about the objectives of the war. Quote, where official explanations broke down, the Washington Post's Afghanistan papers published last December suggested an alternative theory of the war. In a series of articles based on previously unseen transcripts of closed-door interviews with key decision-makers, numerous U.S. officials privately acknowledged believing that the war was unwinnable. Your job was not to win, it was to not lose, one former member of the National Security Council staff said in 2014. Numerous officials described how the war's all-important metrics of success were systematically falsified." End quote. There was no concept of victory, no transcendental purpose for being there. The original idea of fighting them over there so there would be no more attacks here soon quickly dissipated and nearly a decade into the war as the fighting grew more and more unpopular. But the interests of the elites began to seek not only to enrich themselves, but to find reasons to stay which is how a war could start with such spirit to fight back, only to end with its elites begging to stay and nation-build, the very thing their predecessors promised against. Siegel continues, quote, By 2019, however, Mattis was out as Secretary of Defense, a departure triggered partly by disagreements over what he viewed as Trump's reckless efforts to extract American forces from the Middle East. In February 2019, the President floated a plan to get out of Syria and Afghanistan, Immediately, a bipartisan majority formed in Congress to oppose the move. From the Senate floor, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell warned of the dangers of a precipitous withdrawal, shoring up Congress's two-decade-long record as a bulwark against precipitous moves in Afghanistan. McConnell's amendment, reflecting Trump's plan in favor of continued stalemate, passed away with an easy 70-26 to 26 majority." End quote. 
Even now, the leaders, defense contractors, and media heads push on, with no sense of animating spirit, only the focus of the here and now to enrich themselves, profiting off stocks, earning seats on the boards of defense contractors that made them wealthy while in office, all while with a media and consensus-making apparatus that continues this notion towards other countries that have an idea of greater war, or at the very least hold on to the traditions of victories within their own cultures like the Romans once had. Who are its knights? Who seeks anything other than material gain in the warrior caste that was once meant for great honor, piety to its empire or nation? Certainly not that of Lloyd Austin, who was the board member of Raytheon before becoming a defense secretary. Mattis, the Mad Dog General? Well, he's on the board of another defense contractor, General Dynamics. Men whose allegiances, all well worth questioning in terms of fitness of leadership. The contrast between the ancient traditions of chivalry, knighthood, and war are clear as night and day. But I'll leave you all with this. Earlier this week, former Defense Secretary Robert Gates sat down with Anderson Cooper, of all people, on 60 Minutes, portrayed as some sort of neutral arbiter on Afghanistan between Biden and Trump. The man at least had half a sense to claim that he held some partial responsibility for what took place in the Middle East, but it simply was one insider talking to a media head offering insight. Many such cases. Victory was never clearly an option, no transcendental or spiritual reason to carry on this fight or of the liberal project. Francis Fukuyama, while criticized as being a triumphalist, did warn at some point in time that there would be struggles, just so we in the United States wouldn't be bored in this post-Cold War world. Post-Cold War America wasn't prepared, and still isn't prepared, for a multipolar world order, as its rise to empire was at a time of European decline and dealing with a bipolar world, quickly becoming a unipolar power. But alas, the U.S. regime here will continue to thrash, struggle, and look for fights that it cannot win, that it will not win, with no meaning, spirit, or purpose. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all in the next video. Be prudent, everybody.